Pode avançar. Já posso? Sim. Bom, boa tarde, boa tarde a todos os que nos estão a acompanhar, nem mais nesta sessão da Cátedra Unesco uh, um Património Cultural dos Oceanos. Uh, vamos uh, começar a nossa série de conferências uh, mensais uh, da série CIAS. Uh, uh, começámos uh, o ano passado com uma série uh, que, que agora prossegue, uh, procurando assim com, com jogar... Com, agregando colegas de diferentes, diferentes universidades de todo o mundo, com quem, com quem colaboramos, podermos ir refletindo sobre esta relação extraordinária da humanidade, da humanidade com, com os oceanos. Dou-vos as boas-vindas a todos. In particular, I welcome Professor Paul Montgomery, and I would like first to thank you for your disponibility, availability to be with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for your presence. O professor Peter Montgomery vai nos falar hoje sobre Indigenous People, Traditional Ecological Knowledge and Climate Change, the Iconic and the Water Cultural Heritage of Stone Tidal Waste. Ele é atualmente um investigador do Centro, do Centro for Environmental Humanities do Trinity College em Dublin, onde ele tem trabalhado sobretudo nos temas da história, da história ambiental. Tem um, é, doutorado, é doutorado também em História, em História Antiga e na Literatura e tem, uma, tem uma, um trabalho de décadas uh, na área de, da Arqueologia, uh, no, com experiências no Atlântico, no Báltico em particular também, e no Mar Mediterrâneo. Uh, é também uh, professor, uh, já foi professor associado na Universidade de Shandong, na, na China, e trabalha e é colaborador dos projetos em que está envolvido com o CHAM, com o CHAM e com o, e com o projeto For Oceans. São so, Professor Montgomery, I thank you very you so much for your disponibility and once again and please you have the floor to our people. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for your introduction and the honor of allowing me to give this talk today to open up this new season. I'll just share my slide with you now and we will get going. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Where today I'm going to discuss a project that has recently started, but has drawn together a large number of concepts and ideas that are going back for a number of decades now. The title of the project is Indigenous People, Traditional Ecological Knowledge, Climate Change, and the Iconic Underwater Cultural Heritage of Stone Tidal Weirs. This project and this presentation will give you a deep introduction into the project. We are going into the concept of what fish weirs are, for those of you who are unfamiliar with these unique monuments. Uh, we're going to talk about environment, the relationship between the environment and fish weirs, the communities who use these fish weirs, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. If you do have any questions, you can write them in the comments box on YouTube, and my colleagues will forward them to me in the course of this presentation. Now, I should say that this project is a multinational, multi, a multinational and multidisciplinary project, which deals with a number of questions. First of all, a comparative investigation of fishing communities and their national policies and perceptions, in particularly those who use fish weirs. Secondly, integrating social and natural sciences to the study of indigenous fishing traditions, ecological knowledge, and its relationship with what we term the 21st century natural science investigation in terms of a definitive scientific approach to, the, to these uh, sciences. Also, there's the aspect of the engagement of communities in the revival of the use of tidal stone weirs, our understanding of how these fish weirs or tidal weirs or fish traps as they're sometimes called are used, their relevance for understanding how the environment has changed during the last, in some cases, 9,000 years, and how communities in the future can use them and utilize them, and it may, in some cases, revive them as a viable source of protein for them and their families and an income for their community. Now, the team, I'm just going to give you some examples of the international team. We're spread over a large number of countries. We have Professor Bill Jeffries from the University of Guam, Professor Afofuyumi Ibiwachi from Tokyo University of Marine Technology in Japan as well, Dr. Cynthia Zayas from the University of the Philippines, 
uh, Dr. Magda Mulzini from Nelson Mandela University, myself and a number of other members of staff on this project. We are a diverse range of scholars who have an interest ranging from archaeology, history, cultural heritage, heritage management, and we are approach this project in a multidisciplinary and holistic manner to understand the wider world of these fish traps and how they are used and have changed in the last, in some cases, 9,000 years. Now, the scope of our actions, we are endorsed by the uh, Decade of Heritage, uh, UNESCO Decade of, uh, Ocean, Decade of Ocean Heritage, and we are working across a number of different oceans and a number of different environments. The US, the UK, Ireland, my home country, Micronesia, Japan, Korea, China, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, Spain, France. Across these different locations, we have different projects ongoing, looking at fish weirs that are both historical and also ones that are still in use. And we're looking at aspects of the interaction between the environment, the people who use them, and what it can tell us about the long-term health of these communities and the ocean itself. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why study fish wares? How interesting are they? What could they possibly tell us? In reality, the reason for this project is because stone fish wares have been used by humans for thousands of years. And they have been used if, for a range of things, from feeding their families to being part of industries that are producing conserved and preserved fish that is sent all over the world, in reality. So what do we actually know about fish wares? There have been a number of studies in many countries in the world looking at different aspects and sometimes different periods of stone fishware use. In some cases, we have selected sites that have been heavily investigated. We have modern examples that have been built very recently by communities who are using fish traps today to feed themselves. We also have many historical descriptions and a range of environmental data, ranging from sea level change to ecological ecology and a range of other data sources that we can use to understand these things. Well, what can we actually learn from this? What can it tell us about history, about the past, about our ocean's health and the communities who use those? We should look at it from the point of view of coastal ecology and coastal communities in the past have adapted to changes, both political, ecological, to climate change that has occurred in the past and have always been able to persist with their livelihoods in many cases and sometimes have endured for thousands of years. Now, there are challenges that come with this, this project. First of all, Many fishwares are already lost to erosion, to misuse, to overdevelopment of coastlines. Both the tangible and intangible cultural heritage, the history and traditions that go along with fishwares, the fishing communities that use them, have already been lost. There are not many of them really left. Also, in terms of lack of archaeological and anthropo anthropological data. In many countries, there has been no consistent research or study of these monuments, and they've been found in virtually every continent and bordering every sea in the world apart from Antarctica. They are unique in their shapes and sh shapes and sizes and construction, and yet there are strange similarities that, which reoccur whenever you study them. Also, they're highly reflective of the marine ecology, the coastal ecology which they're built in, and how they are developed and used during this period, how they've been adopted or sometimes completely changed to, for new uses or new, new applications. Now, in terms of the data sources that we're going to use in this research, we have a range of sources, primarily GIS, mapping of historical sites. For those of you who don't know, GR, GIS is graphic information systems. And in fact, it is one of the most useful tools for us because in many countries, fish traps have not been recorded archeologically. In some cases you can see them, but you find, ver you find it very hard to find any written records or historical records of their use, or their age, or what they've been used for. Also, cartographic and pictorial representations, as the world has been mapped in extensively in the last 400 years. In some cases, fish weirs, because their coastal navigation issues for shipping, were recorded, their location or their shape. So mariners passing along the coastline would know not to go too close to the shoreline. Also, paleological and archaeological data. How, what, in, in real terms, how old are these traps? What material are they made of? What constructs are used to build them? What are the aspects of their, their uh, use that we, that we can know and tell about it for the local cultural traditions and knowledge which go into building them? This is an example 
if you'll forgive me, of a survey of the Bay of Biscay covering parts of Spain and France. And all of these little points you can see on the map are fishwares that have been identified by our project. Some were already known and some are new discovery. And they give us a, 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 an, an interesting overview of how these, how these monuments are located. It's very random. In some cases where you have the ideal conditions, you have clusters of hundreds of them, and it's a very small area. But other, other cases, you have hundreds of hundreds of miles of coastline and none at all, or none that can be seen due to loss of the archeological record. Now, when you're using GIS or Google Map or whatever platform you're using, many of these sites, this is an example of a group of fish weirs from South Africa. You can see from the image which I'm showing you that this, these are sometimes very hard to understand. You have a range of stone shapes all aligned along the coastline. You can tell that they're fish traps, but you can't tell really how many they are. there really are because of deposits of sand being moved around by the ocean and also really how big they are without getting there on the ground. Luckily, our team and other teams around the world who are taking part in this project have been able to go out to some of these sites and get examples. This is an example of a recording of a group of fish traps in South Africa by one of my colleagues from the Nelson Mandela University in coordination with the first indigenous peoples of the, that coastline, looking at the history and archeology span of traps in the region. With these physical objects, there also comes cultural and historical objects and cultural traditions, which sometimes are completely lost when the communities disappear who use them, but sometimes they also give you a wider range if you dig down into their past. These are examples of fish weirs from the coast, the Pacific coastline of Chile. These are a range of stone fish weirs being studied by a group of academics who I will share your information about them at the end of the talk. Uh, who are investigating the use and regeneration of fish trap use in Chile in this period. One of the things she discovered was a very interesting uh, tradition that went along with these beautiful stone fish traps. It was a, its own mythology, a mythology of a mythical monster, which was half pig, half sea monster, called a cochavillo or cochinillo, depending on which pronunciation you use. In other words, a pig snake or piglet monster who would go to the shore and destroy their fish traps and eat their eat their uh, their catch. This origin story probably has its origin in the indigenous people of the region when it was colonized by the Spanish in the 16th and 17th century. But its name is actually a hybridization of the, the old Castilian word for pig and a, a word for snake in the native indigenous language. And these are unique stories that have been going on and developed around these monuments and are part of the cultural landscape, the maritime landscape, and even the mythical landscape of these regions. And they're living part of the living communities who use them or have in the past. Now you're probably wondering, fish traps, what are they? Fish weirs, there are many names, many different aspects of these monuments. I, in this diagram, which I'm showing you, is an example of how a basic tidal fish trap works. You have a circle of stones, which is directed towards the shoreline. During the high tide, the fish swim in, and as the tide recedes, the fish, the fish are trapped behind the walls and are easily accessible. Now, you're probably wondering, this is, this is a very simplistic technology. It is, but it's universal. It works virtually every time and is highly effective. We have examples all over the world from Japan, with, where there are traps dating to the Jomon period, almost six or 7,000 years ago. The Philippines, where you have a range of differently ornate, beautiful traps along the shoreline, which are built to fit exactly with the high tide and coastal movements of currents in that zone. You have fish traps in Ireland, which I've studied extensively in my own research, which are built a sequence of wooden fish traps and stone fish traps or fish weirs, which go stretch back for almost nearly a thousand years and in some cases are built physically on top of each other because the physical environment was so advantageous for catching fish that from the early medieval period to the post medieval period the owners of these traps decided to build stone fish trap stone fish weirs or traps on top of previous wooden ones which date back into prehistory having shown a consistent use of marine resources a consistent value for this this resource and what it can be used for for communities around the world. Or in Micronesia, where the island states of this very dispersed island, group of islands has a range of fish weirs, which are called ache, which come in a range of beautiful 
beautiful shapes and beautiful sizes, some of which look like arrows sticking out into the sea and are highly effective in catching fish and are still being used by the communities today, who in the last two or three decades actually had a period of revision of what they think is valuable in terms of the cultural heritage and are actually investing more time in its construction. Even in places as far away as Brazil, where you have both coastal fish traps like this, this uh, arc fish trap from the coast of Brazil, right into the middle of the Amazon forest where you have, you have river or freshwater fish traps laying across many of the channels in the heart of the Amazon. These traps are representative of a particular history, a history that has been studied by other people and many great better scholars than myself. Here I'll give you an example of some of the books which I would recommend for anyone who wants to study fish traps or fish weirs and understand their history and complex nature. You have the Strangford Lock book, Published by, published by the University of Ulster. We have The Spirit of Water, published by my colleagues from Nelson Mandela University. A very, a very good book called Fishwares, A World Perspective, the emphasis on the fishwares of the Mississippi, published by John M. Conway, who's, who's a very influential tea thinker and researcher on the topic of fish traps, and also Foragers, Farmers, and Fishermen in Coastal Landscapes by Aidan O'Sullivan from UCD in Dublin in Ireland. Now, in reality, fish weirs are, come in a range of different sizes and function slightly different ways. Here, I'm gonna give you a, a brief overview of the three main kinds of fish weirs we know about. First of all, river fish weirs. These are stone, either V-shaped or sometimes arc-shaped traps. They're placed in rivers to catch freshwater fish like trout, um, salmon particularly, and a range of other freshwater species. They've been dated from prehistory, the medieval and post-medieval period. They're predominantly morphologically, usually in a V or an S shape sometimes, and they've been made out of both stone, wood, and a hybridization, other materials being used, or sometimes stone and wood together. Then you have tidal fish weirs. Now, tidal fish weirs are the, predominantly the stone wooden fish weirs, which occur along the coastline. They are large enclosures of stone set on the coastline, to take advantage of the movement of the tide in and out of a particular area, whether it's a sea lock or a particular bend in the coastline. They've been dated from prehistory and also the medieval and post-medieval period. They come primarily in a V shape or an L shape to take advantage. And it, they do also have been, they also have been found in a range of stone, wood, and sometimes hybridization of both wood and stone together. They've been dated for thousands of years into the past and in some cases are still being used today. You also have longshore weirs. Now these are a unique type of fish weir which exists only on the coastal zone where the current is usually passing along the coastline and they're basically stone fish weirs that are built out into the intertidal zone to take advantage of the movement of, co of the current, whether it's from left to right or whichever way. As the fish are pushed by the current into the trap, they're corralled inside of it and captured. Now this typology was fermented by John Conway and has been published in the book I mentioned earlier and gives us a, a good basis of how to understand these traps and how to understand their, their shape. Now, the thing you have to understand about fish traps, this example is the Baring Baringa fish trap from Western Australia. This fish trap has been dated, forgive me, it's been dated to almost 9,000 years ago and has possibly, there are some pieces of data which suggest that it may have actually been built as early as 40,000 years ago. These monuments are unique in a certain respect. These are some of the largest monuments which are built by humans in prehistory. If you consider, the, if you want to compare for scale, a small house in pre, by a prehistoric society, maybe two, maybe, maybe five or six meters wide and have two or three layers of stone and then some wood on, on top. You have fish traps, being built in prehistory, sometimes that are several kilometers long. And are, in terms of investment of time and energy, and also the understanding of how to build them is highly a huge investment. And our monuments on themselves, they should be considered in the same bracket as physical monuments like Stonehenge or even the pyramids. They may not be as impressive visually, but you will see that the technology and the thought that when it goes into them, though simple, is very complex and very useful to societies. They've been found all over the world, as I said, from the Pacific, even here's an example of some of the stone fish weirs from Chile on the Pacific coastline, which are still being used today. 
throughout history, they've been recorded in many different ways because they've been valued by previous societies as a form of fish, a form of protein, and a form of uh, resource to be used by, by people. There's an example from 1778 of a number of stone fishweirs, stone fishweirs that are being used on the coast of France and are being inscribed and drawn, and in some cases in minute detail, because they are very important aspects of coastal life for societies throughout history and are st were still relevant even in the 18th century to the people who use them and the communities who relied upon them. This is an example of a stone fish weir from Loch Swilly, in, which I'll speak about later in Ireland, which was built in the medieval period and was continuously used up until the late medieval period or late post-medieval period, almost 500 years. When we, th when we think about fish weirs, we have to think about them from the point of view of they're not just monuments, they're structures that are built by people, people who are interacting with an environment around them, understanding the relationship between the indigenous communities who use them, their cultural traditions, the ecology which they are built to manipulate and sometimes take advantage of, and also the aquatic plants and animals that are being used in them. You should realize, you should consider the fact that some of these traps are not built solely for fish. In some cases, they've been used for keeping sea turtles or other marine creatures, whether it's octopus or sometimes uh, crabs, sometimes lobsters, a range of different animals being used or are being used by these environments and how they're kept alive long-term. And in age before refrigerators, keeping your food fresh and alive was an advantageous way to make sure that you have the right resource and access to, to these resources. And they are representative of traditional use and building methods of societies which are lost to us now. In some cases, we can at least see these monuments that are left behind and understand some of the context in which they were used and how they interacted with the environment around. Now, in terms of fishware construction and interaction with the environment, we tend to think about it in three distinct categories. First of all, environmental. You're probably wondering what I mean. What I mean is that there are certain aspects of every fish trap construction when it's being built by the people who are building it, they need to take into consideration. The tide, the current, the bathymetry, the shape of the seabed, the marine flora and fauna which live there, the shoreline of the actual coast itself, the foliage which is close to it and whether it can be used as, as a, a part of the structure, even the geology, the rocks in the area, are they suitable, are they useful? Also the rate of erosion and deposit of the coastline. Is it advantageous to build a fish trap if the current is so strong or the deposits of sand so much that it disappears in a very short time? Then you have the cultural traditions, seasonal resource utilization, a society who understands the environment around it, when fish are going from one location to the next, when is the best time to catch them? Their food traditions, if you catch a lot of fish, are you able to use salt to preserve them or dry them like the Native Americans, indigenous tribes of Canada, which they do with salmon. Also building structures. Do you have the technology, the mental technology as it were, and the knowledge to build a structure which has no cement? One of the unique things about many of these fish traps is that they're not built with any binding in between the stones. They're fitted together in dry stone structures. In some cases, organic material becomes lodged in it, whether it's silt or in the tropics, sometimes coral. And these fish traps become living environment, parts of the environment, living, breathing, if you will, organic functioning traps, which other animals inhabit. And it's been shown that in some cases, fish trap building has actually increased the eco ecological value of these environments. Also, there's implications in the modern terms for coastal management, the reclamation, the change of coastline, ports, waterways. Is it with these traps? Are they being destroyed? Are they being preserved? Is there, case, is there a case for them being more valuable to the society being destroyed? Or in some case being co-opted and being used by society today as a sustainable way to catch fish. These traps come in a range of sizes. This is an example of one of the traps from Ireland, which I recorded. And if you look at this is a, a high definition map of the, of, of the fish trap itself. You can see the high water and low water mark but also you can see that the trap has been built in line with the coast with a bedrock protrusion which comes out, taking advantage, meaning that the trap was actually, the person who built this trap built it in a way which took advantage of the natural features of the coastline itself and, and has unique aspects inside of it. 
is an example from the United Kingdom of a survey of stonefish traps, which are part of our study. And you can see just along the case of coastline of Ireland and England, which is there's only partial, partial, there's at least 150 stone fish traps and weirs that are being used currently or in the past. Now, in terms of climate change, climate change is one of the biggest challenges. Why, you're wondering, to fish traps use? First of all, sea level change. These traps depend on a consistent height of, of water, which to be utilized. They, they are also susceptible to intensive storm damage. They are susceptible to coastal erosion, changes in water salinity, water temperature, precipitation, and the loss of habitat, silting up and depositing, making them useless. Climate change itself has some particular implications for this environment. It damages the tangible and intangible cultural landscape of the coastal heritage. It can destroy bio biodiversity. It results in a lack of, lack of nutrition for marine sea sources for the communities who use it the dissolution of communities and the population of the coastal zone because they cannot consist and persist in their livelihoods and their ecology, and also the extinction of local ecological knowledge and the loss of cultural biodiversity along the whole coastline. Here you can see an example from Taiwan where a fish trap was destroyed partially by a storm, but was subsequently repaired. These monuments are not just sitting there in the coastline, they have to be observed and used and repaired. As the coastline erodes and changes, the traps have to change. Now, in terms of the community utilization of these traps, you have economic uses, traditional economic uses, primarily subsistence fishing, people who fish to feed themselves. We also have historical and modern examples of them being used for commercial fisheries, for the, for the capture of mainly migratory species like salmon or, or trout or other, or lampreys, for example, where these, these fish were not just caught for eating, but caught to be preserved and traded as a commodity around the world. There's also the cultural aspects. They're part of the cultural landscape, the maritime cultural landscape and seascape of the communities who use them, part of their identity. Historical communities, activities, their maintenance, their structure and use define and are part of a person's identity when they use it because it needs to be an, a huge investment of time and energy to keep it going. Also in modern use, there's a range of different activities which they've been used for. They've been used for fish farming, for tourism, landscape as part of landscape conservation project, pro projects, and also as barriers for coastal erosion, because there's, some of them are so well built that they slow down the, their state of, the rate of erosion on the coastline, giving a longer, a longer, a longer uh, lot more protection, I should say, for the coastline where it's being used. This is an example of some of the most iconic fish weirs in the world from Taiwan. These, these fish traps, originally are believed to have been built sometime in the 16th or 17th century, but have consistently been used along this coastline of this island in Taiwan, subsequently for up, to, up until the modern period. We have examples of these traps being built as late as the 1930s and 1940s. These are some of the most iconic and most widely known photographed fish weirs and fish traps in the world. The Shu Shu, as they are known, or fish or pingu fish traps. They are probably one of the most iconic monument examples of this monument and its value and historical nature. These traps, as I said, were believed to are located on Penghu Island in Taiwan, formerly known as the Pescador or Fisherman Islands, on an archipelago of 90 islands and islets in the Straits of Taiwan. They're believed to have been imported to this fish trap method of catching from Fujian in mainland China during the Qing Dynasty. They're communally owned even today, and lots are drawn for access for the communities to use them. Also, many of the households in this area in this area co-opt and use them as part of their daily intake to feed their families. Their main, the maintenance construction is all done communally by the community who use them. And so there's investment identity and a cultural identity which is highly aligned with them. And when it comes down to it, they are also part of the cultural and historical landscape. There's examples of ancient rituals and weir worship associated, which give the locals of this community a sense of identity and their interaction with the marine ecology. There's even a museum completely de 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 sorry, dedicated to these, the Jubilee Village Museum, where young students can come to run an eight-day course to understand these fish weirs, understand how they're, how they're used, both ancient, as you can see here, uh, one from the uh, prehistory or an earlier period, to even modern examples, 
where these fisheries are being used by communities to intensify fishing. You can see in the foreground a large number of stake nets that have been laid out to help intensify its use, make it more economically viable as an entity. These weirs, these weirs are part of a bigger picture, a bigger, bigger context of community and of this period, of this people. Their local history, their sense of society, the cultural practice and their religion. The students who come there learn not only what these traps are used for, they're actually built, taught how to build them, how they function by a master builder, and also are, are imbued with a sense of pride, a pride, a pride in their past, a pride in their interaction with the environment and the value to society around them. You can here see some of the pictures of some of the students who've taken part in these projects. In reality, when it comes down to it, fish weirs are are physical monuments as important as any other monument, whether it's the, the, uh, <laughs> the pyramids in Giza or the Stonehenge. And with them comes an identity and, and a spiritual aspect, historical aspect. This video was made by one of my colleagues from South Africa in, in co-authorship with the first indigenous people of South Africa of the, of the coastline, eastern coastline. And I'm going to show it to you now so you can understand through their own words of these people and their relationship with their fish weirs. On the 5th and 6th May 2017, a project art performance took place at the ancient Khoi San and Khoi Khoi fish traps in Cape Recife, Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Chiefs their communities and other local people with an interest in heritage and ocean conservation participated in a ritual in order to reconnect with nature. Yeah. Oh, oh, no. When I 
I'm look, looking over there, for me, it represents eternity, forever. Um, whenever I walk along the ocean here and I look at the waves, I think about where are they going to be, what is it going to be like when I'm dead. And it's always very difficult to get an understanding, it'll go on forever. For me, the ocean is of great power, it can be molded, but it can also break. The ocean is very important in the lives of the Koi and Sun. We have many rituals that we do in the ocean. We are basically water, and if we don't sustain it, then we ourselves will die. The ocean is a sanctuary where all of our peace lives. To me, the ocean is the connection, connection between all nations. To me, the ocean means the calming voice and the unifying force. Purity, pureness, life. Um, the ocean to me reminds me of my ancestors because when they passed on, we're taught they tied their spirits to the water. So when I look at the ocean, I see a part of myself. The, the water gives everything life and we need to understand it from the heart so that we can change how we are behaving. It's the Isiklosa word, uku shlambulula, to cleanse and to heal. In French, um, the sea is the same word for sea and mother, so it's also kind of something that's protected. And we, so we start from the beginning again with life, because mother like, gives life. For me, the ocean is the future and a new beginning. We have to respect and touch lightly the earth, so that the ocean stays healthy for the generation to come. The ocean is the heart of the world. The water, it's blood. It's a place of birth, it's a place of sustenance, and uh, I think everyone's connected to it, whether it's um, spiritually or physically. I think we need to take a stance sometime or other to look after the ocean for us. Ocean for me means life, life in abundance, and it's of course God's greatest gift to all. The ocean for me is life and joins us all together as one. I would like to, I hope you enjoyed that video. I would like to take this moment to thank the people of the Koi Sun community who live indigenous tribes of this region of the Eastern coast of South Africa, who allowed us to take part and to film this. And in particular, Dr. Magda Mouzini, a member of the team, and also one of the more innovative researchers that we have, and one of the most impressive scholars I've come across regionally on the topic of fish traps and how they relate to society. Ultimately, our goals for this project and for our research is to understand the local community, engagement of the local communities, schools, the revitalization of these monuments, the traditional ecological knowledge, and for the 21st century science in participating with our understanding of both the modern and the ancient. A deep understanding of the resources and represented in books, websites, films, as you've such seen, and identify, describe, and explain the use of tidal weirs to in the different countries which we're studying and how valuable they are to understanding the longer history of humanity and the future in the context of climate change. Also, when it comes to the resource identity and traditional ecological knowledge, these monuments have been around for in some cases 9,000 years. They have witnessed history and climate change and in some cases have survived. Can they give us a deeper understanding of how communities interacted with their past environment? Can they tell us some stories or some information which can help us understand how we can deal with climate change that is hitting us today. And also in terms of fuse the information and the knowledge which is derived from here and also a modern scholarly approach to understand marine ecological conservation framework for other projects elsewhere in the world, to understand how we can reuse and revitalize both our intellectual and spiritual aspects of our understanding of the maritime cultural landscape, these fish weirs. For example, you can see here in the picture, an example of a fish weir that's been turned into a breeding pen for sea cucumbers in the island of Palau, and is still an economically part of an important landscape. This is our social media, which I'll share later on in the video for anyone who would like to come to our Facebook or our Twitter page to see the research we're doing and understand the longer under the long story which we're telling in the coming years. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate your patience. And I guess now we're going to
progress to Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I, I believe that everybody that have been watching you have been really amazed with all your talk. Um, just going to check if we have some questions on YouTube. Um, I actually have here some also some, some questions. Well, Christina Brito uh, says, thank you so much uh, for your interesting and uh, beautiful talk. Um, and she had a question, I'm going to read it. Uh, when you say fish, do you mean only or mostly fish or different groups of marine and aquatic animals, turtles, manatees maybe, or that depend on the habitat and the presence of certain species? You have examples of, I would say the majority of cases we come across have, have focused primarily on fish. But for example, in the South Pacific, we have a range of examples of islands where the local community had a subsistence approach which used the fishers not only to catch fish, but also as pens to capture um, sea turtles, manatees, and very occasionally uh, dolphins, which got, came into it during the high tide. So it does have multiple applications. In the islands of, for example, in Hawaii and also in Fiji, there are particularly kinds of fish traps, or fish weirs, I should say, which are built solely for keeping turtles alive in the long term. So yes, they have multiple, they, are parts of multiple parts of the marine ecology, not just fish. Okay, yeah. I, I also have a, well, uh, my, my question is related with, with this that Christina said. So um, saying that some traps can be built, adapt to certain type of species yes. or some certain type of, uh, well, certain fishes or habits of the fishes, uh, how they move uh, and how they go with the currents and they probably build the things uh, that the structures adapt. Um, Magda Minguzi, Minguzi. Minguzi yes. say thank you and hello from South yes. Africa. So, I should say Magda is one of the members of the team. She couldn't okay. be here at the moment, but okay. she, she's the person responsible for the beautiful video we just saw now. And oh, thank you so much. Magda, <laughs> it was a beautiful video. Um, so Pedro Manuel Pombo say thank you. Beautiful film and book, uh, emotion and so important. Uh, Jan McCann. Hello, I think uh, Anna's. Oh, you're back again. You froze. For okay, <laughs> I froze. For, sorry. Uh, Menina, okay, I'm again, it's okay. Nina had a question. I would like to ask you about uh, the shape of the fish weirds. What defines the shape, the topography? Um, I would say that in terms of the shape, there is such a wide variety. What we can see, there's no consistent shape that is used even across, sometimes across the entire range of the Pacific communities who didn't have the same inter interaction that we know, there's actually similar shapes. And when we look at the, if you go down onto a very base situation, look at it, what you have is a situation where people are adapting to the local shape of the seabed and the current. So sometimes they reoccur. We all know that beaches form. We know that there are certain environmental conditions, certain bio, uh, geographic and uh, marine based uh, coastal processes that are going on, which means that sometimes these fish traps have similarities. But in reality, we don't know if there, there is no consistent example of information, you know, going from one particular shape being carried away. There are, there are some examples in the Pacific, but we're not 100% sure whether it's passed on by word of mouth, or cultural tradition maybe just adaption to a local similar environment. So these are questions which are long-term and which we need to look at, not just because the deeper into we go to understanding fish traps and fish weirs, the more questions actually appear when we realize that we can't just look at them as a, a base monument. We think about them as a three-dimensional building that has been built in a highly dynamic environment, the waves, the currents, marine ecology. 
And like any building, there are multiple aspects, whether it's architecture, knowledge of marine ecology, knowledge of the species that are being used, and how these traps are evolving over hundreds of years. We have examples of traps that are five to 6,000 years old and were in use during that period. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul, um, do you only study this, the, the stone traps or you also study woods and um, I say wicker uh, um, yes. traps? Also. They come in a range of organic materials. Yeah, we've organic come, materials. Yes, we've, yeah. Co we've, we've come across examples made out of uh, oak, of beech. In the tropics, sometimes they use uh, coconut fronds, sometimes they use a range of different uh, plants. We are looking at both stone and, and uh, organic traps, or wooden traps, if you will, simply because there's a huge relationship between the two. The, where fish traps are made, and where wooden ones are made, sometimes they're made in the same environment, like you almost in looking distance from each other. We think it probably has to come down to do with the season that they're being used and the knowledge of, a of terrestrial ecology of the people who are using them. When you're making a wooden fish trap, you use some, some of the same, if you will, local traditional knowledge, but you also need, for example, to understand when do you coppice a particular tree to get the right kind of wood. I myself have studied both both wooden fish traps and stone fish traps and recorded them. And even though they look different, there are many similarities. So there are big overlaps. But in this situation, because many of these wooden stone fish traps, stone fish weirs and traps have a much longer duration and are physically more visible in the archaeological, archaeological environment, it makes it more easy for us to uh, study them. But there are challenges. For example, you cannot date a stone very well. So we have yeah. to look, you know, whereas wood, you can do carbon dating. Yeah. So there are challenges, pluses and cons. So we try to look at both. Yeah, that's another thought that I have. Um, how, how can you know the chronology of the okay. different levels of the stones and of the structure? Well, we've been lucky. Um, the unit when I, from 2010 to 2015, I worked as a, at the Centre of Maritime Archaeology in Ulster in Northern Ireland. And at that institute, we excavated and studied a range of fish weirs. Once you do the excavation, you can do two things. You can find examples of dating material that's under them, give an idea when they were built. In the case of Strangford Lock in Northern Ireland, you have cases where wooden fish, wooden fish weirs have stone fish weirs built on top. So you can actually date the wooden one and the stone one. The vast majority of stone fish weirs are dated by associated material on the shore. For example, in Australia or in the Pacific, you have large middens on the shoreline close to where the indigenous population would process their catch or cook or, or eat their catch. And you have organic materials where you can, you can tell you have fish species, a large concentration, you date the fish species and you get at least an idea of when the trap is being used. There are other aspects, geological and archaeological, which you can understand in terms of coast receding or growth, where you can see, okay, this is how close the, the trap was originally to the shore. And then we can give an idea of how old it is. But every trap is different, every weir is different. They have very com you know, sometimes you have examples of traps that are in use in prehistory. They're left alone for 2,000 years and then they start to get used again in the middle of the Middle Ages. So sometimes their story as an artifact and as part of the maritime cultural landscape can be so diverse that it's very interesting but very complicated to understand. Yeah. Well, Christina Rito also asked about this. Uh, if uh, are there any similarity? fish traps in the Roman Empire? Um, the Romans were prestigious uh, users of marine resources. We have traps from uh, Spain, from France, from the United Kingdom, and also several in the Adriatic, as I understand. There are some similarities, but there's de definite differences. The traps, for example, in the United Kingdom, what is commonly the United Kingdom, part of Gaul, are distinctly different from this period. They're much more, if you will, more indigenous. Where as you get closer to the Mediterranean basin, there are more similarities with these kind of what they call chevron tra fish traps, which are large fish traps that are made to take in just the coastal, or rather the tidal difference. Whereas in the North Sea and the uh, British Isles, you have more longshore fish traps that are to take advantage of the current. So it's probably reflective of, a, well, the Romans were also very good at co-opting other people's ecology and their local traditional knowledge. So there is some similarities, that's for sure. Yeah. One of the big differences, the Roman Empire had a, a long tradition of uh, fish pens, 
keeping fish they ca captured alive in the Mediterranean. And there are some examples from, from Britain and France where these you have examples of these traps are being used in later period, even though it's not the same species. But they, there is an overflow of knowledge, that's for sure. That's a lot of knowledge in this in all this process. Uh, another colleague of, of ours, Anna Rock, says thanks and for this brilliant talk. And so many people is um, applauding all all this uh, presentation and all the subject that you bring here. So I don't know if we have any more questions. Um, no more questions at this point. So <laughs> I don't know I if like, you want to say anything. I would say that what I've shown here today and many of the pictures are, are the work of many of my colleagues from around the world. And also part of our goal is we are a small group of academics and we, none of us want to be locked in our ivory towers, as it were. What we've tried to do is we've reached out to other groups, other peoples. For example, the images you saw from uh, Chile, a group of Chilean archaeologists who are working on fish traps in Chile. And we're co-opting and try to understanding their research and to help them develop. Um, hopefully, when this video goes live, I'll post a range of links to other projects going on in the world, which anyone who's interested, just read down through the comments and you'll find, you'll find my posts. But the reason I bring it up is simply that this uh, endeavor, regardless of what you call it, it is, an, an, is a story of how people have an, interacted with their environment. Looking at how communities along the coastline of nearly every ocean on our planet over the last several thousand years have thought, how can they, how can they maximize their catch? How can they feed their families? How can they have a resource? They're very simple stories about how people live their lives in the maritime environment and how they use their own intuition, their own knowledge, and sometimes their, their deep understanding of the environment which they are living in to utilize it. It's not a unique story, but it is a story that is, is, can tell us a lot about how communities have evolved and shaped in, yeah. in their recent history and into the deep past. So, Basically. This is a universal story. So all of us somewhere around the world have used these solutions um, with yeah. different uh, adaptations, but um, it's a point that many, many of... Um, yeah. And with, with this adaption, there comes also a culture every time, if you will. One of the things we have noticed and which I've noticed in my own studies is that with these monuments that creates a culture around them, whether it's religious, spiritual, as you can see the story, the relation of some of those people on the beach in South Africa. These are people who don't use fish traps, but there's an innate, innate if you will, recognition of when you look at the monuments of Egypt or, or other great civilizations, you can see in it that human aspect and relate it to your own understanding of how you interact with the ocean. Like one of the girls said, the ocean is life. The ocean is living and breathing. Yeah. We are living and breathing along its shorelines. How we, how we understand this, how we co-opt it emotionally, spiritually, culturally, and make it part of our own culture and our own sense of identity is the story of the seas. So hopefully yes. we will unravel a little bit of the story in the course of this project over the next eight or nine years. Well, brilliant, Paul. I think we, we really want to thank you um, and thank you and to all your team who work on, on this project. It was really a pleasure to have you here today on uh, CIHAS. Yeah. Now I'm going to uh, say goodbye in Portuguese to everybody that is at home. Obrigado. Bom, terminamos então aqui esta primeira sessão do CIHAS de 2022. Uh, em março teremos uma outra sessão e que faremos atempadamente depois o seu anúncio e portanto agradecemos a todos que, que assistiram onde quer que tenham estado um, por esse planeta fora por terem estado aqui conosco hoje e até uma próxima. Boa tarde.